the efforts of this weekend is to raise a nation of priests, which is the vision that God has concerning his people. And we trust that um, God will help us in the name of Jesus. Once again, we come before you and we ask for grace that you will supply grace this evening to the glory of your name in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. As you turn your Bible to the book of Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8. First of all, we are going to take um, verse 1 and 2. Hallelujah. And we are in section C now, the way of consecration, the way of consecration. We have seen the basis of consecration. And the basis is that you were, first of all, bought by the price of the blood of Jesus. We have seen the meaning of consecration. Now we are going to see the way of consecration. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Then we are going to jump to Leviticus 8, 22 to 28. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garment, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for a sin offering, two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. Aaron and his sons are about to be consecrated into the hallowed office of the priesthood. On the coronation day, these are the items that were required in order to separate him and set him apart for his operation as a priest. The items that he's supposed to come with for the coronation are metaphors that are symbolic of spiritual rites that is expected of every priest in the land. That was why I was saying that if we are discussing the subject of consecration, there is no way we can do that effectively without stopping by at the book of Leviticus. Because at the heart of priesthood is a writing in the book of Leviticus. Before I continue, if you are a minister of the gospel and you are in the congregation, you can come this way to free up your seat for people that are outside of the auditorium. Now, I'd like us to make a meticulous list out of what was required. Can we go back to verse 2? It said, Take Aaron and his sons with him. The number one, you come with the garments. We cannot look at the garments today. Because if we go into the garment issue, you will find out that the Levite that operates in the outer court, he has three pieces of garment. The priest that operates in the inner court, he has six pieces of garment. And the high priest that penetrates into the Holy of Holies, he has nine pieces of garment. And God speaking to Moses said that these garments are for glory and for beauty. It means that if we want to do business, do priesthood in the arena where glory is, we have to put these garments on. And those garments are metaphors that are pointing to spiritual requirements in order for us to do priesthood in higher places. Now, we don't have time to touch on the garments today. Can you give me my scripture? So we are going to forget the garments for today. 
and obviously we cannot do due diligence to the subject that is on hand for just this weekend. So we'll look for a way to complete the study on consecration so that we can move to the next subject of interest, which is separation. So put the garments aside. There's an anointing oil, which is an object of separation. We don't have time to talk about the anointing oil too. Because the compoundment, there was a prescription, a recipe of how the anointing oil should be compounded. And it's according to the act of the apothecary. Now there are seven items that are brought together in order for you to get this holy anointing oil. And those seven items are all metaphors. Now that's speaking about spiritual things in God's corridor. But we do not have time to touch on the anointing oil. The act, there is a way you compound it. It's, it's a skill. It's, there is a method with which it is compounded and is according to the apothecary. When you bring them together, then it forms the holy anointing oil with which you sanctify things and separate them unto God. And the implication of sanctifying a thing is this. Are you with me? If I take this handkerchief, for instance, and I go to the temple and I tell the priest that I have come to offer this to the Lord. All right? If the priest should anoint it, because it's the anointing that sets it apart as God's property. So the anointing has that authority. If, it's an, if he anoints it and sets it apart, you can no longer use this handkerchief as face towel. Every mundane use that it was put to before it was given to God ceases to apply to it from that day. You know there are goats in the market. But if you take one goat and take the goat to the shrine and say, I give this to Ogogo, then in the evening you change your mind and say, I'm not giving Ogogo again. I want to collect it. There's a more we allow you to go home. But Ogogo, you will answer to Ogogo. Do you understand that? Because Ogogo didn't beg you to bring goat. You were the one that went and said, Ogogo, I hail you. And you brought goat to me. All of your rights on that which is sanctified unto God are lost. And you cannot put that which you brought to any mundane use. If what you brought was a cup, it has lost all its mundane applications that you used it for prior to its being sanctified. Are you with me? Nebuchadnezzar's son, what was his challenge? Vessels that were sanctified unto God, he now brought them back to use them for a mundane use. He felt they had drank so much wine and they felt that, oh my God, now let us offend spirits. Or you are going to the chambers. Bring the vessels of the house of God that were brought from Jerusalem. It was those golden vessels that they used to drink wine. They, they were still drinking when a finger appeared on the wall and said, Mene, mene, tekel, ufasim. The corridor of priesthood is, is, is dangerous. Because if you know the spirit that you are serving, and you are properly aligned with that spirit, you are going to be blessed. Right? You will be in the good books. Of God and we see that all through the Old Testament so it's needful for us to know a few things and God will help us in Jesus name they say bring garments bring the anointing oil bring a bullock and then they mentioned the purpose of the bullock which is a sin offering do you know what a sin offering is I'm going to explain to you today and then what else bring what two rounds and then after that a basket of unleavened bread. These are the items that were required in order to consecrate and set Aaron and his sons apart for the work of the priesthood. Somebody in the congregation might say, oh, we are studying the Old Testament and trying to teach New Testament believers. You are ignorant of the fact that the Bible is prophetic. You are ignorant of the fact that the Bible reveals that these things are shadows of things to come. So there's a spiritual meaning for every metaphor that appears in this scripture, which has grievous implications in your practice of priesthood. Remember, God will not just have accept any offering just because it is offered. You must have taken inventory of the kind of offering that Cain sent to God 
and God did not even, he wasn't diplomatic about his rejection of both Cain and his offering. God would not accept just anything from everybody. Hallelujah. And that's the reason why we need to know God. Because today, most of our priests think that God must receive what they are giving. But unfortunately, it must be according to prescription. That's why we need to come back and take an, a close inventory of how these functionaries were eventually separated onto the priesthood. Hallelujah. Don't ever forget. Is it 354 or 154 years after Jesus ascended to heaven? What the church had as the Bible was the Old Testament. It, it was about 154 years later that what we call the New Testament now came into being. Are you here? So those early saints, the scriptures they had was devoid of what you have, the addition that is called New Testament today. So every preaching and teaching that was done that time was revelatory. Interpreting the metaphors that were captured in the Old Testament and unveiling their true spiritual meanings in the context of the liberated covenant that God has brought us into. So when you want to push your Old Testament thing, be careful. Because the moment you attempt to use the meta rule to say this part of the Bible is Old Testament and this part is new, you'll be wrong. Because you find the great apostles still quoting the Psalms to establish their claims. Even the simple doctrine of justification by faith, Paul could not do it without drawing from the testimony of a source code. Is that clear? Now, so you must understand the spirit of our ancestors. Our ancestors, in order to establish truth, had to journey into the heart, the writings of the prophets. They had to journey into the dealings that God had with our ancestors in order for them to crystallize encounters and revelations that they had from God. In this day, one of the labors that God is doing rigorously at this time is the recovery of truth. Because just like humankind suffered from a fall, the church suffered from a massive fall. And part of the things that went lost during the course of this fall was the truth of the word of God. And the evidence of that is that the church started looking like the world. And our goals were no longer different from the goals of a natural, bona fide unbeliever. Our preaching and teaching became self-seeking self -seeking and self-centered. So much so, that there was a massive migration from the preaching of the gospel to positive thinking and all the rest. So in the labor of the recovery of truth, it will be needful for us to sustain the doctrinal culture of our first fathers. How that they sought truth. From where? From the source code. And they brought everything that was hidden in metaphors and in similes into full prophetic light by reason of the spirit of wisdom and revelation that was oppressional upon them. All right. If you paid attention to the reading that we just did, in your list of items... You shall have a bulwark, which is supposed to be the sin offering. Who knows the New Testament meaning of the sin offering? Sister, I'm hearing you say something. Kashima? Yes, respond to us. It's Jesus. Do you have a scripture to back that up? You don't have. It means you can't speak in the parliament. In order for you to have a voice in the parliament, you will need a scripture. We, our culture is drawn from the revelation 
of the mind of God that is enshrined in the scripture. We are supposed to be such people that think in scripture. We think and talk in scripture. That, that's what forms our culture. And no one among us has more authority than the scripture. So even if I become a, an archbishop tomorrow, if there is anything like that, all right, and I come and say something that is not in the scripture, it should not be followed. Because we are operating under the authority of the scripture. We must exalt the scripture. So, sister, do you have a scripture for your claims? Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, 17 and 18, he say, okay, go to 18, just go to 18, so that I will not bother you. He said, now, where remission of, where, where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for, for sin. Go on. Oh my God. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Jesus happens to be our sin sacrifice. The payment that God needed in order to acquit humankind of the rebellion of our first fathers. Jesus was the sin sacrifice. So when when in the book of Leviticus chapter 8 there was a requirement for a bulwark which was supposed to be a sin offering, what God was telling us from that point was Jesus. Is that clear? Alright, so we are trying to bring the New Testament interpretation from the types and shadows and the metaphors that are contained in the Old Testament delivery. Because we believe that the New Testament is hidden in the Old. And it will take the spirit of wisdom and of revelation to unravel it. In fact, there are many subjects in the Bible that do not have enough muscle. If we start trying to establish those doctrines from the book of Matthew to Revelation. In order for you to get muscle for those teachings, you will need to journey to the source code. That's the way of teaching. Hallelujah. So the bulwark that they were supposed to come with was the sin sacrifice. That means they had to be born again in order for them to become priests. You can't be a priest if you have not yet appropriated the sacrifice of Jesus, which is upon which took place upon the cross, so that the goodies that resulted from God being sated on the basis of what he did into your life, if you have not received that, then don't bother about priesthood. So the foundation of priesthood is redemption. And Jesus happens to be the sin sacrifice. And if you believe in what he did on the cross, then you have entered into the community of priests. So... The first thing is the bulwark. So the subsequent things now are, are, are required for the consecration proper. Because the need to consecrate comes directly after your salvation experience. In fact, are you here? In fact, you are a counterfeit Christian if after you gave your life to Christ, you did not proceed directly with consecration. You are counterfeit. What you are trying to do is to use the resources God has are available for you to adorn your own ambition and intentions. And that is contrary to the intent of God. I can show you in... Okay, let me, let me journey with you. Let's journey. Because everything we teach in the Bible, we should be able to connect it to the life of Abraham. Every principle, every doctrine, we must connect it to him because he's the father of these discoveries. The father of faith is the one that began to interface with God without seeing him and he was able to know him because that the infrastructure to deal with God through faith is very solid in the invisible realm. So Abraham was the one that pioneered it. He pioneered those dimensions and unveiled possibilities and all of us are extensions of Abraham and his DNA is in us. If you check the story of Abraham, 
Are you with me? We'll come back to, where are we? Leviticus, okay? Let me digress to Genesis. We'll come back to Leviticus chapter 8. Genesis chapter 12, that's the call of Abraham. This is the story of Abraham. Are you with me? Now, let's, let's do some Bible study. Um, can we go to the book of Genesis chapter 11 before we go to chapter 12? In Genesis chapter 11, verse number 27. Are you there? Genesis eleven twenty-seven. 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot, Abraham's younger brother. is the one that gave birth to Lot. Is that clear? Next verse. And Haran died, that means Lot's father died, before his father Terah in the land of their nativity. They, their village was in a city called Or of the Chaldees. And um, those of us that have studied archaeological findings, archaeological books and journals, you will find out that uh, the first civilization known in human history is traced to all the Chaldees, Abraham's village. So Abraham's village was like the light. And the whole world was like darkness. They were, they were, in terms of technology, visibility, in terms of possibility and actualization, you, you talk about all the Chaldees. And it happens to be that Abraham came from a strange family. It's his family that was dedicated to the service of the spirit that was responsible for that civilization. Are you with me? And that spirit... Are you see here? All right. Based on my study, this one is not in the Bible, this is study. The spirit was called sin. S-I-N. Sin. All right? So his family was dedicated to that, to the service of that spirit. So in terms of knowing how spirits talk, the guy was not really a novice in interfacing with spiritual things. He was a wise man according to a dark order. All right? And the spirit that he was in service to was a fertility spirit. And fertility spirits are spirits that um, give children and give harvest. Okay? So, this guy had a voice in his head. And the voice was stuck there. And the voice was demanding that he leaves his context, he leaves his village to a land with an unknown address. Now, he, he, he's been doing priestly stuff. He's been intercepting and interacting with all kinds of spirits because of his lineage. And uh, even though he was in service to a fertility spirit, his wife was confirmed barren. And the spirit he served, hallelujah, could not handle her barrenness. And so, this voice that was talking in his head demanded that he should leave home. And in leaving home, because of the structure of the kind of community that he came from in the Middle East, the people that uphold family much more than any other tribe in the world are the Middle East tribes. If you go to the Muslim communities, in the United Kingdom, somewhere in Scotland, you will find a man, like if my father were still alive, he will have a house. Me, my wife, and my children will have one room in my father's house. Because it's a community that is built, family is critical, family. Right? In that culture. So there was no way Abraham was going to obey God if he did not get the consent of his father. So by discussing with his father, this is what happened. Are you there with me? I want to show you the pathway. Um, he said there's a voice in my head, though, and that voice says that my destiny will not be fulfilled in this land. In fact, the voice insisted that I leave this country 
I leave this kindred and I leave your house. So the requirement of the voice is that you delete my name from the lexicon of this family. And just consider that your son died. Now, for any reasonable father that you come up with such an information, he's likely to believe that you are running close to mad, if not mad. So this is what happened. After Abraham's younger brother died, you know, the males are becoming few. And then this firstborn that is supposed to continue his legacy has gone mad. A spirit, something is talking to him. And the thing is saying the kind of thing that is contrary to family. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So this is what the guy did. In verse 29. And if Abraham, mm, 31, sorry. Let's go to 31 quickly. And Terah took Abraham, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, the do his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from all of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Now, don't leave that scripture. Don't leave. Who is leading these people now? Terah. Is, is, is Terah the one that God called? Now, Bob Terah felt his son was mad. So he, he said, all right. I, oh, you, you said we should move. No problem. We're going. But I'm going with you. And then when they moved, they stopped in Haran. That was not the destination. And the word Haran means delay. God called this man when he was 25 years old. His father helped him delay for, uh, for um, 25, for 50 years in Haran. And then that thing you see in the book of Genesis chapter 12, which we call the call of Abraham, you didn't check it properly. In chapter 12, the Bible says, and the Lord had, said, he told Abraham since 50 years ago, it was when Abraham was 75 years, that he became the leader of the clan. Are you, are you following so he is the one now to determine where they went. And unfortunately for him, God told him that he should leave the clan and go establish another civilization. And because he felt he was the eldest son in the family, it was his responsibility to travel with the clan. And so he had to take Lot. And that was contrary to God's instruction. So he now set out for the journey that he was called to make at the age of 25, he's setting out at the age of 75. Let's see how he... You know, this man understands priesthood. Now that he has decided that he wants to obey, his obedience began from verse 4 of Genesis chapter 12. So Abraham departed that the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took his wife, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, into the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanites were there in the land. I don't want to touch that scripture. That's not where I'm going. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto, and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. The first thing that God, Abraham did when he entered the land was that he raised an altar of consecration. See, this altar he raised was not an altar that he raised after the other priesthood. It is the God that appeared to him that he raised this altar to. And the meaning of this altar was a complete committer that I am ready now. Nothing, there's no string attached. Nothing resisted me. I'm ready to serve your will. That was how Abraham started his journey of faith. He started it on the altar of consecration. Your own story cannot be different. Because we are trying to crystallize many versions of Christianity. How that you don't go too deep. You are just in the periphery. Go and be a Muslim. Because there's no such provision for the arrangement that we have in the Bible concerning a Christian. Consecration is critical. 
This was a, him now, in, by an act of his own will, he was surrendering to everything that God had available. Even though his obedience was not complete, but it was a major landmark in the life of Abraham. He was saying to God, I am willing to plead your will out. I am submitting to your authority. Have your way in my life. That's what Abraham did in verse 7. I just wanted you to note that. Let's go back to Leviticus quickly. In Leviticus chapter 8, you can't take consecration out of the Bible. We see believers that are loose without any evidence of government or authority over their lives. That's not Christianity. In fact, one of the things that makes church church is discipline, is authority. He said that brother that refuses to recognize the authority of the church, make him like one of the unbelievers. And let it be known to you that whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. It's in that context that that scripture was written. That by the church's authority, eh, as you cast him out like an unbeliever, he say, he say whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. The first thing that happens to him is that you have removed his covering. Covering of three levels. First of all, we have covering on your property. Then we have, I'm, and I'm quoting from the book of Job, but I don't have time to open it. Covering on your property. Then covering on your children before covering on your life. So if you wake up in the morning and you see that your property has been plunged, it's a great question. You need to ask God a question. Oh, okay. You don't, you are not following me, so I'll leave that. I'll leave that. Don't worry. Leviticus chapter 8. So the bulwark is the sin offering, which is our salvation. That's what produced our salvation. So you cannot be talking about priest, priestly business without having, first of all, experienced salvation. Now that you have experienced salvation, the next thing is the two rams. So take us to the book of Leviticus chapter 8. We'll begin from verse 22. What is the protocol that is required for the two rams? For God's sake. Leviticus chapter 8. The first ram is what we call, is used for a burnt offering. That one, you don't take anything out of it. Now, I need to explain to us what exactly is a burnt offering. Because the first ram is the burnt offering. The second ram is the consecration offering. I'm more concerned about the consecration offering, but we need to find out what the burnt offering is about. What is the burnt offering? You get a ram, you put it on an altar, and then you put fire under, and then you burn it to ashes. And then the fragrance ascends to heaven. That's a burnt offering. If you check the book of Leviticus, I don't have the time to do that. Leviticus chapter 1, Leviticus chapter 2, Le Le Leviticus chapter 3, 4, and 5. It tells you the kind of sacrifices that priests should offer. Because one of our jobs, one of our duties as priests is that we are supposed to be educated to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. And a mighty catalog of these offerings were unveiled in the book of Leviticus. As I have told you before, the first offering that is unveiled in the book of Leviticus happens to be the sin offering. That's the offering that is still playing out here. Right? And you know what it means. Because he is our sin sacrifice. He was the offering that God accepted as a means of clearing out the deficit on the human race. Right? You know that. You are born again. Glory to God. It means on your behalf, the sin offering has been offered and you accepted it. The implication applies to you. Second is the trespass offering. The trespass offering is required when one commits an infringement against the law of God. God says... You shall not commit adultery. And the person goes ahead to commit adultery. 
Do you realize that under the Old Testament, all the offenses that are captured in the Ten Commandments are capital offenses? And if you are caught in any of those offenses, the judgment is also capital. You'll be stoned to death. Right? But you see, the Old Testament never envisaged that a possibility of forgiveness was available in God. It didn't envisage that. But see, in the New Testament, we have forgiveness. Forgiveness is only possible because of the potential and the stature of the blood of Jesus. For the Bible says, in this Jesus, we have redemption. Even the forgiveness of sin. The same facility infrastructure that produced our redemption also produced this blessing called the forgiveness of sin. And it is according to the riches of his grace. In order for you to get forgiveness for sin, there is a sacrifice that you have to offer in order to get forgiveness. And that sacrifice is repentance and confession of sin. That's the second sacrifice, the trespass offering. And this sacrifice is a sacrifice that the modern faith, modern grace preachers have come to say is not biblical. That a believer should not confess his sin. That it is unscriptural for the believer to confess his sin. Even though in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says if we for confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? No, there are two reactions there. To forgive us our sin. Your sin requires forgiveness. But, what? And to cleanse us from your unrighteousness requires cleansing. But what you did was that you confessed sin. But two things happen in response to confessing sin. One, he forgives your sin. And then he cleanses you from what? Because acts of unrighteousness are contagious. And they have the capacity to reoccur. So what he does is that he doesn't only confess the sin, uh, cleanse the sin. He puts you on a path of justice. Do you still remember David? David went and slept with somebody's wife. Is that true? God forgave him. But to ensure that he will not sleep with another person's wife. And meanwhile, sleeping with somebody's wife was a capital offense. So David had to kill in order for there not to be any, anybody living to press charges against him for committing a capital offense. Do you understand? The same David that did not kill to ascend the throne had to kill to preserve it. And there was nobody fitting in that kingdom that could press charges against him. And so Nathan, God had to wake him up. If we study the life of prophets, we find out that there were, there were law enforcement agents of the spirit. Nathan went to meet David. And the judgment of God was unveiled to David through Nathan. He said, between me and you, nobody is here to press charges. But the sword with which you kill that man, it will wander in your house for some time. That judgment was in keeping with the need for him to be cleansed from unrighteousness. Oh, you are not with me. You see, it's very easy for you to miss the judgment system. There's a judgment system, judgment arrangement that is built into our work with God. And it is built into our work with God for good reasons. To ensure that you don't lose your salvation and to ensure that you don't lose your destiny. That you still be in right standing with God to be able to pro prosecute your destiny after a fault. So God doesn't only cleanse you, forgives you, but he does what? He puts a protocol of judgment in place to purge you from unrighteousness. So when that sword came and many men died, like Absalom, the, the king had to escape on, with bare foot. When all of that process ended, in his old age, they tucked a virgin into his blanket because the cold in winter was on the high side. So they brought a virgin, fair to look upon. 
and smuggled her into the blanket. The old man, after the dealing, the old man didn't touch her. Because he was cleansed from that act of unrighteousness. And built into him was a system that could resist that weakness. Because he was not only forgiven from his sin. He was also what? Uh So the justice system of God had to act in order to save his soul from the destructive tendencies that unrighteousness will sow. Satan is a farmer. He goes around looking for for how to sow seeds so that even if you break through in life, you will have a harvest from it. I don't want to press for that. But you see, Satan is a good trader. Well, maybe, 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 maybe. You remind me. Let's talk about spirit trading flaws sometime. Then you'll find out why lust can be so passionate. It is because the devil is seeing what you'll become. So he comes and gives you something that is inferior. Hoping that he will trade with you to negotiate away your greatness. The spirit realm is very practical. And if you have never gone to the Nigerian Stock Exchange platform to, to, to trade shares, you might not know the reason for several temptations. If you have more insight, it will be more difficult for the devil to deceive you. God will not only forgive you your sins, he also wants to put you on a scale so that that seed that the devil has sown will do what? Will be cleansed. So that you will be able to finish strong. The devil is in mad chase. It's a mad chase of your soul. He wants to ensure that you that say you will not serve the idols of your fathers, that you will end up on the altar. He will want to haunt you. And so when God sees tendencies in your life, when he sees tendencies, what he does is he puts a protocol in front of you so that those tendencies are cleansed. That's how men become strong. The strength of a man is measured in the day of adversity, in the day of temptation, in the day when Satan breaks loose, seeking an occasion on your life, and your will is, is steadfast. Your alignment with God is steadfast. Your covenant with God cannot be compromised. That's a proof of strength. It means you have a God in your life. But when you see believers of compromise, they have no God. When they cry in the day of trouble, no one will come to their aid. There were two offerings there. And the first ram was the burnt offering. The burnt offering is what happens when Romans chapter 12 is fulfilled in your life. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto god and when you do this kind of thing you know what god will do he will release fire to consume the sacrifice eh? you have presented your bodies so what he will do is that he will release fire this fire of the holy ghost that we talk about is not only designed to molest devils and demons you, you know you we, we we like it those of us that are in ministry you like when you see a manifestation then you speak in tongues say god is moving hallelujah i'm telling you today <laughs> that the fire the, the the work of the fire is not just to molest demons is also to sanctify you some terrible passions that you have when you come under the fire you are sterilized And those passions die. From that day, you become a carrier of fire as a proof that you are a burnt offering. Mm, A proof. So if there is fat there, and there is a lust that is tied around that fat, give it time, the fire will melt it. And the things that used to haunt you before, a day will come when they try to haunt you, the remote control has no more compatibility. Because the Holy Spirit, through fire, has scrambled all the communication boards. You know, when you stop drinking and then you pass close to a beer parlor, there is a salient smell that you perceive. That those of us that never drank will never perceive. A secret smell of invitation to fellowship. (laughs) 
If you, if you understand what I'm saying, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, there's a secret. You, you need revelation to be able to detect that smell. If you have not been, if you are not well disciplined in beer drinking, you may not understand that that secret exists. But when you begin to carry fire, a time comes when the entire system is crumbled. And somebody might sleep drunk close to you, but you didn't perceive it. It's because the fire was also designed to purge you internally. That is the workings of Jehovah Mekadishkam that purifies with fire. Have you read the book of Malachi chapter 3 before? Give me Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Let me end there. If I have time tomorrow, I continue. Because this matter, we need to take time. Don't, don't you, you know people think Christianity is shallow. Look at the life of Moses. You will know it is not. After all those years of service, God still brought to mind the fact that he was supposed to speak to the rock and he struck the rock. And that disqualified him entrance into the land of promise. At least he did not go into Jerusalem with his physical body. His entry into Jerusalem was when he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He didn't go there with his body. God heard his prayers. Okay, you want to enter? No problem. For now, see it and die now. And then it was many years later that he was given the opportunity to stand on the Mount of Transfiguration. That God, don't joke with him. The way we have made him clinical. We made him, we made him look like a performer. We made him look like a liar. He comes with fire in his eyes. That God, fear him. Fear that God. So one of the things the fire does is to cleanse. So that Satan's computer can have no compatibility with your soul. That's the technology of the burnt offering. It's a burnt offering that makes you a living sacrifice. Even though you are alive, but the fire is still what? Consuming. The fire is still consuming. The fire is still consuming. I was listening to the chief intercessor in right hand bonkey's ministry one one lady one wonderful lady and she was talking about the fire that it was this fire that the lord kindled on her life that is the result of that is the reason for the sacrifice they don't feel the sacrifice again because there is a fire this one is burning out and there's a fragrance of sacrifice that is ascending to God perpetually. That's the reason why Satan can't destroy her. She's operating under the fire. The fire is what motivates a man to do things that are not, they are not logical in terms of sacrifice just to satisfy God. A carrier of fire is not trying to meet needs, but is trying to meet a need on the heart of God. His own paradigm is different. His own, his own shape is different. It's totally different. If you try to use the scorecard of humanity to understand him, it will produce fail. But in the sight of God, he is of great price. So the fire is a quality control equipment that ensures that you become more and more a tool that is useless to the devil. So he brings the products of lust. His products are useless to him. Why? Because he's a creature that is undergoing burning. Burning. Give me Malachi chapter 3. He said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, say the Lord of hosts. Now this is the question. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he shall be like a refiner's fire. That's the, that's the appearance he chooses. He shall be like a refiner's 
sanctified. The, 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 this is the Lord, our sanctifier, Jehovah, Mecca Dishkem. No, no, not every believer will know him in this manifestation as fire. This is not fire for molesting demons. This is fire for purity. This is what kills lust. The antidote for lust. The antidote for a desire for iniquity. For you to go and surf the internet for naked women. This is, is Mekadishkin. He said, can you stand the flame? In order for God to release you into higher service, Mekadishkin will do some work on you. <laughs> can you stand the fire? He said, but who shall abide in the day of his coming? God will not take you beyond your purity level. No. And just in case you go there, you are ensnared. Who shall abide in the name of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he shall be like a refiner's fire. A refiner's fire. A refiner's fire and like fuller soap. And the purpose of the fire is in the next verse. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Huh? He will look for a seat in order to work on your case of lust. That anytime you see women that are short, your knees knock. He said, That infirmity will put the gospel in the bad light. <laughs> So when he wants to deal with your case, he'll bring a seat. And he kindles a fire. And he, just like the bellows of a blacksmith, he will not stop doing his thing until when they bring you out from the furnace, he can see his face, his image on the sword. That's when he stops. When he's no longer lost, you see. When it's no longer an intention to raid a bank because you are you are serving mammon and the appetite for greed has been enlarged looking for people to prey upon it's a, an unfortunate situation when a pastor that's not dealt with greed comes behind the pulpit he preys on a generation and so god knows that kind of liability can be brought on his name so when he comes as a refiner he comes with a seat so that he can do a thorough, he will sit as refiner and what and purify our silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi. Only priests know why God will not accept holiness is established because his glory. If God rages, if he rages, if he rises, many people in the church today will die. If the God of the Bible, eh? If he comes with splendor, if he comes with his glory, he shall kind of mm, will not survive it. So in order for him not to break out on us as a plague, a plague more deadly than corona, the time they cannot find the source of the death, test tubes and bullets and pipettes cannot help investigate how these ones went. All right? So, in order to avoid that, what he does is he, he brings a seat to purify. A seat as a refiner and a purifier of silver so that he can purge the sons of Levi. He will purge them like gold and silver so that they can offer unto him an offering in righteousness. That's when their priesthood is upgraded. And when they offer an offering, High cherubs of glory can be dispatched. Things that are locking in darkness. People that boast in the name of deities will be humbled instantly. So it's the quality of our priesthood that is not up to standard that has made people that speak for Satan in the woods to still have a boast on their tongue. That's our prayer point. Malachi chapter 3. Seat. In the seat of refiner. In the seat of of the purifier of silver and purge the sons of Levi so that out of among us such that can bear an offering and offer it in righteousness might emerge 
He will not only forgive your sin, He will also cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You take over, holy fire, fall upon my altar. Holy fire, yeah, fall upon my altar. From within me, spirit, you take over. Holy fire, fall upon my altar. And holy fire, fall upon my altar. From within me, spirit, you take over. Holy fire, fall upon my Holy fire, holy fire, holy fire, fall upon my heart. Sing holy fire. On my altar, holy fire, 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 holy